So over the last couple of lectures, really for the whole class, we've been looking at how do we solve different thermodynamic processes. And I've been making the argument that these processes are like Lego blocks. And eventually, pretty soon now, we're going to learn how to put these Lego blocks together to make thermodynamic cycles so we can turn heat into mechanical energy or so that we can use mechanical energy to make heat transfer from places that are hot to places that are cold. Or at least make it look like we're doing that. Really, we just make a machine that has a hotter side and a colder side. But we've been looking specifically recently at open systems. And these open systems, I've been saying, okay, the first thing we need to do is draw a control volume. Then after we draw a control volume, then we do conservation of mass to make sure we are accounting for all the mass that's coming in and out of our system. And then we do conservation of energy, right? Because every little bit of mass carries energy with it. So we needed to know what was happening to the mass before we knew what was happening to the energy. But these processes, process two and three, only tells us what would happen if the process was possible. None of these three steps will tell us if something that we're doing or that we're trying to design actually can happen in the universe that we live in. So let's do a little bit of a thought experiment to determine whether or not certain processes can happen. So my family and I, we like to go camping. So one of the things we do when we're camping is we have campfires, right? So here we have a fire right, or we have some wood, we're going to draw a control volume and we're going to have a campfire, right? So now what's happening is as we're burning this wood, mass is leaving the system and heat is leaving the system too. So we have heat out and mass out. So what if I now try to do this process in the opposite direction? So now I have this, maybe my campfire is not burning anymore, but it's spent. Right, so now it's, um, it's a bunch of ashes. But the good news is I collected all the mass that escaped when I was burning my campfire and I collected all the heat or maybe I'm just gonna put an equal amount of heat back into the system. If I did that, would this system turn back into logs? Right now, I think we've all lived in the universe long enough to know that this doesn't happen, right? Um, it's like if you have a matchbox, right? So, I mean, maybe people don't use matches anymore, right? But if you have a match and you strike it against sort of the rough part of the matchbox, it ignites, right? And then it sits there and it burns. But you can't unstrike the match and get the match stick back, right? Even if, in our case of the logs, even if we put back all the mass that we had before and all the heat that we lost, we don't go back to the original products. So why is that, right? The first law and conservation of mass are both being satisfied here, right? So why does this not happen? So it turns out this is not critical if you're observing a process, right? So, but if you're trying to design something, right? You have this idea and you wanna see if it works, we're gonna add a fourth step to our process here of analyzing different thermodynamic processes. So this step asks the question, is the process possible? And here we're gonna get an introduction to something called the second law of thermodynamics. So here, right, again, if you're observing something in real life, so let's say you're working at a nuclear power plant and your supervisor tells you, oh, Go uh, take some readings from that turbine so you can see if the efficiency is slipping or something, right? You don't need to ask, is the process possible? Because you're seeing it with your own eyes. But if you're designing some kind of new process, you might want to ask yourself, is this something that can actually happen or is it sort of too good to be true? So the second law, the purpose of the second law. So all thermodynamic processes have a natural direction. Right? So we can take this match, strike it, and it'll burn. Right? So, but we can't do the opposite even if we're still conserving mass and conserving energy. So that match burning process has a direction that it will flow in. Right? So the second law will tell us what's the direction of a particular process. So thanks for coming back to Thermo. This is lecture 18 
the second law of thermodynamics. Why we can't have perpetual motion, or maybe why we can't always get what we want. So in order to understand the second law, we have to understand another type of property. So we've been looking through these tables, right? And on the tables, they have little u, that specific internal energy. We've learned now about little h, specific enthalpy, which is u plus PV. But there's also this s, this little s, right? And this term is called specific entropy. So what is entropy? If you read this in a textbook, entropy uh, is maybe defined something like this. In any natural process, there exists an inherent tendency towards the dissipation of useful energy. I kind of think of this, I think I may have alluded to this in a previous lecture, but I tend to think of the universe as a big bank, right? And people in the universe, or even just the universe in general, is constantly doing transactions, right? Now, a bank deals with monetary transactions where we're, you know, having money change hands, but the universe, the currency the universe deals with is energy. So there's all these energy transactions that are happening thermodynamically, right? So we're changing heat for work. And every time one of those transactions happens, the universe takes a cut. There's like a transaction fee, right? That's this dissipation of useful energy. So this is some measure of disorder or randomness in a system. Now, oftentimes you'll read people will say something like, oh, if you don't clean up your room, it will tend to get messy over time. And I think people use that kind of an analogy to describe the second law. It's not my favorite kind of picture to draw when we're talking about the second law. I prefer to think of this match, right? Where the match can move in one direction. We can, we can scratch the match and ignite it, but we can't unscratch the match. We can't, uh, you know, we can't unstrike the match and get the match stick back. So it tells us a direction of a process. And it also captures this idea that there's always losses inside the system. Now, entropy is a little bit special. It's a little bit different than mass and than energy. So both mass and energy are conserved in the universe. Entropy, though, is not conserved. In fact, as long as we draw our control volume big enough, and that's an important point, um, entropy in the universe is always increasing. Right now, I've read Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, and I won't pretend to tell you that I understand all of it, right? But one of the things that I liked was he taught, well, how can entropy be always increasing? That doesn't make any sense. But in that book, it talks about, uh, you know, the arrow of time and the arrow of entropy. So time in our universe is also always increasing. We're always moving forward in time, and entropy is always growing. Right? So that's a way that you can remember that entropy is always increasing because it's just like time. Entropy has some units. So if we're talking about entropy, capital S, this is the extensive version of the property. This would be in kilojoules per Kelvin. But if we're talking about specific entropy, which you'd look up in the textbook, this will be per kilogram or kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, right? Because we take the extensive version and divide it by mass to get the intensive version of the property. So what is the second law? So the second, second law of thermodynamics tells us that the total entropy in the universe can never decrease or that every system has losses so we can't have perpetual motion. So this means, right, so this is important, right? So this means the total entropy of the universe can never decrease. We'll look at this a little bit later, but I told my brother this when I was teaching the first time I taught this class. My brother's a biochemist. He's also a professor. And what I would say was, oh man, I'm teaching thermo. I really like teaching thermo, but we're about to get into the second law and it's really tough to describe entropy. But the one thing that I know about entropy is that the total entropy of the universe never decreases, right? Entropy never decreases. But I think I phrased it that way. I think I said entropy never decreases. And my brother, who's a uh, biochemist, so they don't take the same thermodynamics class that we took. He took a class called physical chemistry. And he said, what are you talking about? 
Entropy decreases all the time when we're doing condensation reactions. And that's when I realized that I wasn't precise enough in what I was saying. And I said, no, no, it's important to remember that when we look at entropy, we're not talking about the entropy of a given piece of mass because that can de decrease in lots of different processes, right? Like condensation, like he was talking about. Um, we're talking about the entropy of the universe. So what that means is that if the entropy of some water vapor is decreasing as it condenses, that means that somewhere else in the universe, as a result of that condensation reaction, something else has an increase in entropy that's larger than the decrease in entropy of the water. And we'll see that from the second law as we start to do numerical examples. And what this means is that we can't have a perpetual motion machine, right? And perpetual motion machines, uh, they're just trying to break even, right? They're not even trying to um, reduce, or they're not trying to, to reduce the amount of entropy in the universe. They're just trying to make it stay constant. But everything we do increases the total entropy of the universe, even if it's making something more ordered somewhere. So every system has losses, so we can't have perpetual motion. So why not? So in any process, there exists an inherent tendency towards the dissipation of useful energy, right? So this means that every process is irreversible. If you take a pendulum, right, and you pull a pendulum back and you let it go, pendulum is designed so that it, you know, it ticks and talks with the same frequency. But what will happen is if you don't, like if you have an old grandfather clock or maybe your parents do or your grandparents, it'll have weights, you know, so you'll lift up, you know, the one my grandparents had, the weights looked like little pine cones, right? And you lift them up, right? And they're on a chain and those chains are driving the gears so that you're bringing the, uh, the pendulum back to its same amplitude. But if you didn't have those weights, what would happen is you'd pull the pendulum back and you'd let it go. But the friction in the system would make it so that on every stroke, every swing of the pendulum, the amplitude decreases just a little bit, just a little bit, till eventually the pendulum wasn't moving at all because it's not a reversible process. If the process was reversible, what would happen is you would grab the pendulum, you'd pull it back, you'd let it go, and after one period, it would come exactly back up to the same height that it had. But that doesn't happen because there's losses in the system. Irreversibilities are ways that useful energy is dissipated in a process. So in that example of the pendulum, moving back and forth, some of the irreversibilities are the friction that's in the mechanical system that's allowing the pendulum to swing back and forth. So friction between surfaces is an irreversibility. It's some way that energy is lost, often through heat. Electrical resistance. So if you run a current through a wire, that wire is going to lose some heat that's given by the current that's flowing through the wire in the resistance of the wire and chemical reactions are irreversibilities. So what is a reversible process? So the first thing that we know about reversible processes is that they're like the tooth fairy. They don't exist in real life, but just because they don't exist doesn't mean that they're not useful models. So a reversible process is a process that's ideal. So that would be one without any irreversibility. Reversible processes don't really exist, right? So that's important to remember. But if we model processes as reversible, right, as ideal, remember we talked about a pump in a previous lecture and we said, well, if it was ideal, it would have no temperature change across it, right? Because we didn't know the real way to define a reversible process yet. But if we can model a process as reversible, it helps us to understand how the ideal process would look, right? Which gives us kind of a, a maximum threshold that we can approach, but never attain, right? So even if we can't model something, uh, knowing the ideal process can help us define how we're doing, right? So often,
what we'll do is we'll look at, say, a turbine. A real turbine is going to have some level of performance, right? And we often like to define performance as some kind of a percentage, right? Some kind of an efficiency. And the way that we'll define how well that turbine is doing is we'll compare how well that turbine is doing compared to an ideal turbine. So we can never get, we call this isentropic efficiency, and we'll define it in later classes mathematically, but we can never get a 100% efficient turbine. It's impossible to do as well as the ideal turbine. But if we look at how close we're getting to that ideal turbine, it might give us a hint on whether or not it's worth the effort to try to continue to increase the efficiency of the turbine. So how do we compare ideal processes with real processes? So in a reversible or ideal process, those two words in thermodynamics are synonymous. So if something is reversible, that means that it's ideal. In a reversible process, there are no irreversibilities. And if there are no irreversibilities that are causing us to sort of dissipate useful energy, then that means that entropy generation would be zero. Right, so we would be breaking even, we would have something that looks like a perpetual motion machine. But we know there are no perpetual motion machines in the universe. So we know that these reversible processes are not possible. If we look at an irreversible process, that's a real process, right? Because it's, if it's not reversible, then it's irreversible, right? Then there are irreversibilities. There are ways in which we're dissipating useful energy. So in real processes, we're generating entropy as long as we dry, as long as we make our control volume, our field of view big enough, then we'll always be generating entropy. So this is great conceptually, but what does it really mean, right? How do I account for entropy, right? Because we have an equation that lets us account for mass, which we know is conserved, we have an equation that helps us account for energy, which we know is conserved. So can we have an equation that accounts for entropy, which we know is not conserved? So how do we know how much entropy is created or generated? We can use the second law of thermodynamics. So this is the equation for the second law of thermodynamics. So here we have delta S, heat over some temperature. This is a temperature that stands by itself, right? So we know this is going to be absolute temperature. And then there's some entropy that comes into our control volume and some entropy that goes out of our control volume. And then we got this little sigma term, right? It looks like Charlie Brown or something, right? What that tells us, that's the entropy generation term. We need in real processes for entropy to be generated. So this is the elapsed time version of the equation. Again, I'm going to go through what the units look like for this equation. So first, we know that delta S is kilojoules per Kelvin because we've defined entropy that way. Well, I know if I take Q divided by T, Q is in energy, right? This is a heat transfer. It's not heat transfer rate. There's no Q dot. Divided by temperature, which is in Kelvin. So that looks good. I have a mass multiplied by kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. That's also going to give me kilojoules per Kelvin. That's true for the inlet and the outlets. And then I have this entropy generation term, which also has to be in kilojoules per Kelvin. This is going to tell me how much entropy is generated by the process that we're doing. Verbally, the change in entropy within a control volume, that's delta S, is equal to the amount of entropy entering the control volume by heat transfer plus the amount of entropy entering the control volume by mass transfer minus the amount of entropy exiting the control volume by mass transfer plus the entropy produced within the control volume by the irreversibilities. So this is the term that tells us that entropy is not conserved and we know for real processes, entropy must be generated. So this has to be a positive value for a process to take place in the real world. Unlike energy, 
entropy is not conserved. So this is the elapsed time version of the process, right? And we know that any process that violates this condition will not proceed. But what would it mean for a process to violate this condition? In order to figure that out, we'll have to look at this entropy generation term because we know that entropy must be generated. So this has to be a positive value. So for a process to occur, we have to satisfy conservation of mass. We have to satisfy conservation of energy. And we have to show that entropy is being generated or that this sigma term is positive. So this is the rate form of this equation. If we divide both sides by delta t and take the limit as delta t approaches zero, we'll be left with this form of the equation, which is the rate form of the equa equation. So what does this mean? So this is the time rate of change in the amount of entropy within the control volume at some instant in time. Right now, this is really hard to picture, but this is kind of the equivalent of in mass conservation, again, if my cup is out there in the rain, it's increasing the amount of mass in my cup. So this is the same thing, but instead of looking at mass in my cup, we're looking at entropy in my cup. At steady state, this term is going to go to zero. Now we find that first by looking at the rate at which entropy enters the control volume by heat transfer. That's going to be the heat transfer rate divided by some temperature, which we know has to be an absolute temperature. Then we'll look at, we'll add the rate at which entropy enters the control volume by mass transfer and subtract the rate at which entropy exits the control volume by mass transfer. Then we'll add the rate at which entropy is produced within the control volume by irreversibility. So what does violation of the second law look like? We know that the key component here is this entropy generation rate. For a real process, entropy generation must be happening, right? So that means that there must be entropy increasing in the universe. So the entropy generation rate must be positive for a real process. For an ideal process, the best we could ever hope to approach and not actually equal is the process where entropy generation is zero or that there is no entropy generation. We can't quite get there, but maybe we could be generating entropy at just a really, really small rate. If entropy generation is negative, then we know that the process can't happen in the universe. So, what does this look like? If I was drawing a turbine where my inlet temperature and pressure were high, so the inlet to this turbine is a superheated vapor. Now we've been talking about drawing these on TV diagrams, which is always a little bit tricky for me because I know that eventually, now, we're going to start talking about TS diagrams. So we're going to look at temperature versus specific entropy. So we'll see this as we go through, but just like how we like to draw processes on PV diagrams, because we knew the area underneath was work, there's a specific reason why we like to draw these TS diagrams, particularly for turbines, pumps, and compressors. So let's say we have an ideal turbine. So if we have a turbine that's ideal, we might make all of the following assumptions. First, that it exists at steady state. So it's operating at steady state. Nothing is changing with time. Second, it's one inlet and one outlet. So the summation signs here go away. And we know from conservation of mass, steady state, one inlet and one outlet, that m dot in is equal to m dot out. We might also assume for this ideal turbine that it's adiabatic, meaning it's not losing any heat. And if it's ideal, we know the very best that we can do is break even on entropy so that the entropy generation term is equal to zero. So if we have an ideal turbine, what we find is that zero is equal to m dot, remember there's only one mass flow rate because it's steady state and one inlet, one outlet, 
S in minus S out. And as long as the mass flow rate is not zero, the only way that this happens is if S in is equal to S out. So an ideal turbine will be a turbine where there's no change in specific entropy between the inlet and the outlet. If we have a real turbine, we'll make almost all the same assumptions that we're at steady state, one inlet, one outlet, adiabatic, but entropy generation is positive. So entropy generation here would be m dot times s out minus s in. Again, remember that m dot is some positive value. So now I don't necessarily care what this number is, except that it's positive. So if it's positive, it means S out, the specific entropy at the outlet, must be bigger than the specific entropy at the inlet. This is not true for all processes, but for turbines, where we're making these assumptions that are listed, we'll see that entropy, specific entropy of the fluid that's running through the turbine must increase. So S out must be bigger than SI for this process. So if I'm drawing this on a TS diagram, right? So I go from the inlet of my turbine for the ideal process, S2S. So this, our subscript now, this is S2 if it was ideal. And we use this shorthand 2s in the subscript to tell us that. So if we were drawing the ideal turbine process, we would move from S1 to S2s vertically. So here this turbine would have a vertical line down between state one and this ideal exit state. But what about the real turbine exit? So when we did the first law analysis for the real turbine, we saw that S2 has to be bigger than S1, but I measured the pressure at the outlet of the turbine. So I know that it's still gonna be on this same constant pressure line here, but it has to be over to the right of the ideal exit for the turbine. So my real process slants down into the right when I'm going through a turbine. What about an ideal pump? So remember, pumps and turbines, they give us the same equation for the conservation of energy from the first law. Let's see what happens in the second law. Again, we'll assume steady state, one inlet, one outlet, adiabatic. And if it's an ideal pump, no entropy is generated. So sigma dot becomes zero. Zero is equal to m dot times s in minus s out. Or s in has to equal s out. For the real pump, again, we're at steady state, one inlet, one outlet, adiabatic, but sigma dot has to be greater than zero because this is a real pump and entropy in the universe has to be generated. So now sigma dot is equal to m dot times s out minus s in, and we know sigma dot has to be bigger than zero. So again, the specific entropy at the outlet of my pump has to be bigger than the inlet of my pump for the real pump. So again, if we're drawing this on a TS diagram, if we're drawing the ideal pump, we have a vertical line up from the pump inlet to the pump outlet as we're increasing the pressure. But for the real pump, S2 has to be bigger than S1. So we have to jot over to the right Again, we measured the pressure at the outlet of the pump, so we know it's at this constant pressure line. So the real pump, if I'm drawing it on a TS diagram, now goes up and to the right. So the turbine went down and to the right. The pump has to go up and to the right. Both of these processes need to go to the right because we're increasing the specific entropy. Now, you might notice that for both of these processes, entropy, specific entropy of the fluid moving through the system increased. And that's great. And then maybe it's a little bit more intuitive because I'm telling you that entropy has to increase in the universe. But I also told you when I had this discussion with my brother that sometimes the entropy of a particular fluid can decrease 
for example, if we're cooling something down or if we're condensing something. So what happens to the second law when the heat transfer rate is not equal to zero? So for both the turbine and the pump, we assumed that that heat generation was zero. And we'll answer that question, but not until next class. So I'll see you next time on thermodynamics when we learn a little bit more about the second law, particularly how do we deal with the rate equation when we have this heat transfer term. See you next time.